Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hi, and welcome all to our day early celebration of International Women's Day. I'm Nina Easton. I'm co-founder of Smart Women, Smart Power. I'm also co-CEO of Sellers Easton Media, which is a multimedia firm focused on stories of leadership and impact. We founded Smart Women, Smart Power seven years ago, believe it or not, to, uh, to amplify the voices of women leaders in global security and foreign affairs. And since then, our stage has showcased incredibly impactful women, luminaries like Melinda Gates and Christine Lagarde, uh, senators, members of Congress, ambassadors, uh, scientists, and even astronauts. The impact, especially on women who are pursuing careers in global security and international affairs, has been pretty profound. I mean, I remember myself moderating an event at the U.S. Naval Academy, and I was surrounded by these young female midshipmen who said that the Smart Women, Smart Power podcast had motivated, inspired, and informed them. And here at CSIS, uh, when we hold live events, we, of course, have those high-level professionals here, but we also have a lot of women, diverse women, who are pursuing their own paths, carving their own paths to make impact as great leaders. Many of you will notice that Beverly Kirk is absent. Um, that's because she's actually working with me. We, are, we have founded a uh, innovative and exciting new program called Journey. Um, and Bev is the executive director of that nonprofit. We have a pretty uh, ambitious goal, which is to change the trajectory and diversity of women at the top. Uh, we're ex kind of excited because uh, tomorrow, International Women's Day, marks the deadline for our first uh, cohort of applicants to our fellowship program. But never worry, Bev is not straying far from these halls. She's still a senior associate at CSIS. Today, our guest of honor is going to be interviewed by Suzanne Spaulding. And I want to thank Suzanne and Seth Jones for guiding Smart Women, Smart Power into 2022, which we can have, when we can have live events again, it's going to be very exciting. And uh, Suzanne has a truly extraordinary career herself. Um, she is, uh, she's the Homeland Security uh, Senior Advisor here at CSIS. And she's the director of the Defending Democratic Institutions program here, which obviously is very timely and important right now. Uh, Suzanne has served in a range of administrations. Uh, she was undersecretary of DHS, where she uh, led an agency that's now called the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. She's uh, worked for the CIA, she's held high positions on Capitol Hill, and in addition to her CSIS duties, she is now, uh, she served on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission and is a member of the Homeland Security Experts Group. So I wanna thank Suzanne. I also want to thank once again Citi and turn this over to Candy Wolf, who is the uh, head of global uh, government affairs at Citi. Again, could never have built this program without Citi. So thank you so much, Candy. Thank you, Nina. And thank you for joining all of us this morning as we celebrate International Women's Day with the first event in the Smart Women, Smart Power series for 2022. I'd first like to start though by acknowledging the horrifying situation unfolding in Ukraine. City has more than 200 employees in Ukraine and our thoughts are with them and all of those who are in harm's way as this attack continues. city has been supporting Smart Women, Smart Power for the last seven years, as Nina said, to bring together women leaders in foreign policy and national security and the business community to convene a dialogue on the most pressing issues facing our world. So on behalf of City and the more than 100,000 women in our global workforce, Happy International Women's Day to all of you. At Citi, we're proud to call ourselves a leading global bank as we are present in more than 100 countries, 
This often means that a geopolitical event, such as the one unfolding at the moment, we find ourselves in the midst of. Our global footprint gives us a unique view on the challenges and opportunities that exist in various political climates around the world. Today's guest is no stranger to many of those same climates. We're very fortunate to have with us the Honorable Michelle Flournay to join us to discuss gender equality and sustainability as well as world events, topics that are to priorities for city. I'm looking forward to hearing from Michelle and her perspective, and so I'll pass it to Suzanne to get us started. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much, Candy, and thank you to City for your support of Smart Women, Smart Power. And thank you, Nina, for your uh, prescience in uh, starting this wonderful program, uh, along with Andrew Schwartz, and of course, our, our beloved Beverly Kirk, who you've stolen from us, but, but to a wonderful opportunity. Uh, and I want to thank Alexis Day, who continues to support the Smart Women, Smart Power program here at CSIS so ably. Um, but mostly, Michelle, I want to thank you for taking time out of what I know is a crazy schedule always, but particularly these days, to come and have a conversation with us It's uh, as our celebration of International Women's Day. And uh, I, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about the theme of International Women's Day. We're going to talk a little bit about your career and being a, uh, such an impressive uh, role model for women in national security. But I want to start first with the issue that is uh, so much on the forefront of our minds today, and that, of course, is the horror that is unfolding in Ukraine. Um, and I, you know, har hard, hard for anyone to know where this goes, but, you know, you are in as good a position as anyone to analyze what's happening and, and what are the options. What do you think is the most, or some of perhaps the most likely directions in which um, we should expect this to unfold? Well, uh, Suzanne, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here as part of this program and to commemorate and celebrate International Women's Day. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, the situation in Ukraine is going to get worse before it gets better, although we've, we were certainly surprised by some of the logistical and morale problems that the Russian forces have had. They have not performed as well as one would have expected. Um, and, and we've certainly been surprised by the incredible resilience and commitment of an outgunned Ukrainian uh, force and population. Um, you know, even given those surprises, I, I do think that the Russian forces will lay siege to a number of Ukrainian cities and eventually surround Kyiv with the purpose of trying to topple the government. Um, I think given their tar direct targeting, of civilians against international law, um, uh, we're going to see the death toll climb. But I don't think the Russian forces have enough to sustain any kind of success they may have in Ukraine. Um, but I also don't think the Ukrainians have what they need to fully be, repel the Russian forces. So I think this is going to be a very tragic and costly months-long struggle. It may transition to more of an insurgency type of model. Our assistance to the Ukrainians, uh, US and NATO, will be critical in that period. But I think the most likely outcome, is at some point, the, Putin comes to the negotiating table and wants an off-ramp. I do think that this will be incredibly costly to the Russian economy. The solidarity of the Europeans with us on sanctions, the willingness to go after things like the central bank, like SWIFT, uh, now we're talking about energy. This has surprised everyone. <laughs> and that solidarity among the democracies um, of the transatlantic community is very powerful. And I think, it's, I think at the end of the day, history will look back at this as a tremendous blunder by Putin. But it's also going to be very costly, not only to Putin, but to the Ukrainian people. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking. Uh, but it, there are also obviously really inspiring moments that we're seeing here, one of which you alluded to, which is the unity in the, in the uh, determination and response, first and foremost, of course, of the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian government, the courage of individuals in Russia standing mm -hmm. up and mm -hmm. protesting this war. And, and of course, the democracies coming together, really nations all over the world coming together to make it clear. Uh, and I, you know, you and, and so many others have talked for years about making, 
the, the importance of playing to our strengths as a democracy, right? Mm -hmm. There are those who, who sometimes seem to have authoritarian or totalitarian envy uh, with how easily those kinds of regimes can move or make decisions or crack down on things. Um, but democracy has tremendous strengths, and we're seeing it today, right, with having real allies versus client states mm -hmm. who are coerced. Um, and the transparency that democracies are used to living in that has served us well, I think, in, in pre-bunking, pretexts mm -hmm. for war, mm -hmm. and getting word out that strengthens the resolve of populations and therefore of governments to come together. Do you see this as, as some of these things that we've talked about over the years about playing to the strengths of democracies really being exercised and implemented in this yeah, case? Absolutely, and, and you mentioned the pre-bunking or debunking. You know, I, I think this administration has really set a new bar in terms of how to use intelligence, rapidly declassify it, put out the truth, the facts, in order to deny an adversary like Putin the, you know, the ability to misuse or to manufacture information um, and untruths as a sort of basis for some kind of manufactured provocation that, you know, we've been able to take that narrative away from him internationally. Now, he's, you know, shut down all of the media in Russia uh, to just the state-owned um, outlets, so he's been able to control the narrative pretty well in Russia. But other, everybody else has no, there's no, you know, mystery about what's really going on here. So I think that's been a success. And then I think, you know, it's been remarkable to see hundreds of thousands of people pro this weekend protests across Europe protesting the Russian invasion of Ukraine, democracies really speaking up for democracy and freedom, countries like Germany flipping um, to cut off Nord Stream 2, to set, being willing to, to invoke the, the sanctions um, with regard to SWIFT, um, to send arms to Ukraine for the first time in German history. I mean, it just, it, it's really been quite remarkable, but I think um, our European friends have really been awakened to the very real threat that Russia poses to democracy in Europe. Yeah, and my sense is that populations in the United States and around the world are, they're clearly responding to the humanitarian sure. crisis here and, and, act, and responding out of compassion. But I have a sense that they are also responding out of a fundamental sense that this is wrong, mm -hmm. that for a country to invade a neighbor country to take it over yeah. is, and so even though they don't know the term rules-based order yeah. that we talk about in Washington, yeah. We, they have internalized a sense of that and are responding yeah. in some ways to and that. I think people feel like this, you know, we had Europe whole and free. We, we and at peace, you know, we, this is like, this shouldn't be happening in the 21st century, especially not only the, the aggression itself, but the approach of these siege tat. I mean, we're back in the Middle Ages where Putin is trying to starve and freeze and, you know, target civilians to break the will of a democratic a free people. It's just, it's chilling. Yeah. Um, and it really, we need that very powerful united response. So the humanitarian crisis is huge and growing. And one of the things I really want to talk with you about, Michelle, is the work you've been doing since you got out of government mm -hmm. with non-governmental organizations sure. like CARE. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe you can talk with us a little bit about what you see these humanitarian organizations, uh, civil society, doing to respond to the humanitarian crisis there. Yeah, well, um, I'll just speak to CARE and as an example of, of international NGOs. You know, so CARE has long been focused on women and girls in development and also in humanitarian crises. So when something like Ukraine pops up, we immediately started a $20 million campaign. Within a couple of days, we were halfway to that goal. We're using our global networks to get humanitarian assistance to those in need. Um, but what really drew me to CARE was the focus on women and girls and the focus on measuring impact. It's the, I, I've never seen any other NGO that is more disciplined and analytic in terms of really saying, are we having lasting impact and being able to quantify you know, the, 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 you know, the, the outcomes um, that we're going after. And the focus on women and girls is really based on a, a premise, which is, I think, now proven again and again in multiple studies, that when you empower women and girls, when you lift them up in development efforts, you actually 
accelerate and scale much more quickly the lifting up of the whole population of which they're in part. Um, when girls go to school, um, when girl, you know, women become breadwinners, uh, when they do uh, village savings and loan organizations, they don't you know, go gamble the money away on a Friday or drink it away in the bar. They, pay, they take the money they've got, they put it into their children's education, they put it into their businesses, they put it into loans to others in the community. And so it's really a powerful, powerful way to scale and accelerate um, your, your outcomes. Yeah, terrific. Well, we're going to come back to that. Uh, but first, I want to talk about your recent trip last week to Taiwan. Yes. President Biden uh, asked you and several others to, to travel to Taiwan. Tell us a little bit about that trip. What was it about and, and whatever you can share with us in terms of outcomes? Sure. So in the midst of the Ukraine crisis, you know, um, China has been rattling the saber even more vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan. And I think this administration was right to want to reach out and reassure the Taiwanese people and the Taiwanese authorities that um, we are, we're, you know, even though we're obviously preoccupied with Europe, we are thinking about you, we are committed uh, to supporting your ability to develop your own defense capacity, we're committed to you as a, de a democracy and as a very important economic and technological partner uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And so we went out um, to, to meet with the members of the administration and convey that message. and. Uh, it was very, very um, timely. There's a lot of discussion about, you know, the parallels or lack of parallels between Ukraine and Taiwan in Taiwan, and so much so that, as you know, Taiwan is one of the main manufacturers of masks. They, while we were there, they, they handed out the stand with Ukraine <laughs> masks that we it. could all wear. Um, but I think, um, you know, uh, one of the most important things that needs to happen in this crisis is that China needs to learn the right lessons, which is not that you can just walk in and invade a thriving democracy and get away with it, but, but that you will experience tremendous costs. Um, my hope is that what happens to Russia in the mid to long term as a result of this action will be a very sobering lesson for Xi Jinping when he thinks about uh, the future of Taiwan uh, after the 20th Party Congress this year. Yeah, uh, I, I can't help but think that Xi Jinping uh, must be very unhappy with Putin at this stage, uh, not only just for generally complicating uh, his life in terms of uh, China walking the line here in their response, uh, but also I do think that uh, if China did move in uh, to Taiwan at this point, uh, go against Taiwan, that that it would be compared very much so to Ukraine in a way that if this hadn't happened, uh, Xi Jinping may have been able to muddy that narrative a bit more. Right, yeah. And I do think, you know, this is more the China-Russia relationship. You know, I think we have to be careful that it doesn't become a more strategic alliance. But at this point, I really do think of it more as a marriage of convenience. But I think if Putin continues to misjudge or goes too far, I think there will be a point where she wants to distance himself. Um, we're not seeing that yet. I think right now he's doubling down on trying to um, soften some of the economic impacts that, that Putin will experience from the sanctions. Um, but um, longer term, uh, I think, uh, I hope that uh, what will eventually happen to the Russian economy and to Putin's um, you know, power, if you will, or his I think he's going to make himself an international pariah for the remainder of his days. And I, I don't think that's something that she is interested in becoming. Yeah. So you made a few references to the targeting, Putin's targeting of civilians um, being this international pariah. The UN has talked about opening investigation on war crimes. Yeah. Um, does that complicate efforts to find an off ramp or? A negotiated. Yeah, I think I think we I think I mean I would hope that the administration's thinking about timing and sequencing. I mean clearly there's no question that civilians are being directly targeting targeted and that is a war crime. But uh, in terms of pursuing it, um, you you want to make sure that you sequence this so that you have an opportunity to still sit down with Putin to end this by negotiation if that's possible. Again, I don't think this is coming in, in the coming weeks. I think this is months away, sadly. 
but at some point he's not going to be able to achieve his goals here and at some point um, he's going to have to you know find a face saving try to find some kind of way off the ledge yeah um, well it's uh, it's a fascinating time to have an opportunity to get your insights on this and mm -hmm. Um, but I do want to shift gears. We are okay. here to celebrate International Women's Day. Uh, and, and, and in getting ready for this, um, I, I did a little research on International Women's Day. Uh, and, I, and I thought this was just interesting and, and relevant. Um, the date for International Women's Day wasn't formalized until a wartime strike in 1917 when Russian women demanded bread and peace. Yeah. Four days into the strike, the Tsar was forced to abdicate and the provisional government granted women the right to vote. Um, and that is the date that we now I celebrate. I didn't know that. That's I didn't a wonderful know that piece either. of history. Right. Um, so there, and there are actually a couple different themes for International Women's Day. The International Women's Day website um, is promoting the theme hashtag break the bias and is encouraging people to imagine a world free of bias, stereotypes, and discrimination. Um, but the United Nations is celebrating the theme of gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. And I know this is, uh, Michelle, an issue that you have thought a lot about and, and written a lot about and worked on. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously relevant to the work that you're doing with CARE and other organizations and, and something that you thought about when you were at the Defense Department. Mm -hmm. uh, the role of, so let's start with sort of the, the security element of climate change and its disparate impact on women and girls around the world? So, you know, I think that um, as climate change occurs, um, you're going to, we're obviously seeing more frequent, more severe weather events, natural disasters, and so forth. Um, I think over time, um, some of the impacts with regard to availability of water, arable land, sea level rise, we're actually going to see, start to see climate-induced uh, migrations, large-scale population movements, um, and or potentially greater conflicts over increasingly scarce resources like water and arable land. Um, and so that, I mean, those are security issues. Um, it, mean, it, it has implications for the U.S. military mission in terms of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief and support to civilian authorities and that. It has implications in terms of the types of conflicts that we may see that touch on our interests or those of our allies in the future. But it also has direct impacts for the DOD in terms of, think of all the coastal facilities that we have. The Navy's already done a study that shows that many of its facilities will be underwater if the worst outcome uh, you know, happens. And so um, these are very real impacts um, in, in security terms. It also often disproportionately uh, impacts women because when there is a crisis, when there's a, 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 a pinch, the first children pulled out of school are girls. The first people who are pushed back into poverty um, are women. Um, and so they are the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable. And so it does have a disproportionate impact. Yeah, and they are often the ones, almost always the ones around the world responsible for finding water in yes. places where water is scarce. Yeah. The farther they have to go, the greater security risks. I mean, very practical, right, as you right. know, right. tangible kinds of things. And I know that um, NGOs have been very involved in trying to uh, address that. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But talking about DOD, DOD has now come out with a couple of documents in which they recognize climate change as a national security issue and, and the direct relevance to DOD that you talked a bit about, but you also have written <clears throat> about the ways in which DOD could be more, could think about this more broadly in terms of the tools yeah. it can bring to bear uh, to help address climate change, including yeah. things we talk about in other contexts, use of its purchasing power, mm -hmm. right, to mm -hmm. insist mm -hmm. on, on green, greener uh, technologies, it's construction uh, all over the world and in the right. United States. Maybe talk a little bit about some of those broader. Sure. Yeah. So DOD has actually long recognized the impact on mission, the impact on facilities, the impact on potentially on operational readiness. Um, but I think the, the opportunity that I think this administration is putting forward is 
you know, DOD is, a, is the largest real estate holder in the United States. It owns one of the largest civilian fleet of cars, black SUVs and sedans and so forth. Um, and if DOD, DOD is of such a size, and plus its research and development budget is, is quite substantial. And so if DOD were to you know, shift in a direction of hybrid or electric vehicles, for example, if, if, if we decide, and I think the administration is moving in this direction, that as we replace those fleets, they, they have to be electric or hybrid, that's a demand signal to U.S. auto industry that is going to move the needle substantially. They know that means they know that there's a certain amount of demand that's going to be there. They can accelerate their transition to more, more and more of their production being electric and hybrid vehicles. So that's that's what I meant by a market maker. And I think DoD could be very helpful in that regard. Similarly, with regard to to real estate and construction. Um, you know, this would, could be a great quality of life issue, frankly, for military families uh, around the country um, to, you know, to have more energy efficient homes that reduce their costs, to have more uh, clean, uh, you know, environmentally sound uh, construction. So there's real opportunity here as DOD replaces or rebuilds its housing stock or builds new housing stock. Yeah, yeah. We, um, th you know, folks sometimes complain about how huge the Defense Department budget is. We could turn that uh, huge purchasing power into a into a, yeah. something that could drive us. I will in the right say direction. though, this is controversial. I mean, I think when you go up on <laughs> Capitol Hill, you have a lot of support for anything that's mission oriented, anything that has to do with operational. Readiness. For example, there are lots of interesting pilot programs with regard to deployable off-grid energy systems, so that to reduce the supply chains and the fuel supply required for you know expeditionary operations, um, that kind of thing Congress will support. When you start talking about DoD as a market maker, um, there are some, particularly on the Republican side, who will defect and say, "No, that's not the department's job, and I'm not going to give you." So. I think this will be an interesting debate that will be coming up, particularly in the 23 uh, bu budget, yeah. uh, to say you know how how broad of an agenda will Congress support? Yeah, and I'm sure some of it will be balancing uh, those uh, broader objectives against any impact on mission readiness, yeah. on yeah. cost, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. The other way that you have been involved in, in trying to address these concerns about sustainability, obviously, is through these non-governmental organizations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about both the direct work in, for example, uh, water resources in communities around the world, and, um, but also the, the work to just empower women and girls who can be such powerful voices right. and have been such powerful voices. Uh, advocating for change behaviors and policies to to address climate yeah. change. So I think you know um, CARE has a presence in over 90 countries around the world, and with the advent of accelerated climate change, they've sort of built into you know their the programs they already have, whether it's you know clean water and sanitation, agriculture, sustainable agriculture, uh, e education for women and girls savings and loans for, for, women's, for women's communities. Um, they kind of built in climate as a, not as a separate thing, but as a, an integrated thread into everything they're doing. And it's really focused on community resilience, trying to anticipate, trying to get ahead of what is coming 10 years, 20 years for some of these communities and making the investments year by year by year so that if and when the change does have, happen, they can be more resilient and survive it, survive it better. But on, the, on this issue of empowering women's voices, I just want to tell you one, one story of uh, when I was, I traveled with CARE um, before COVID to visit a lot of their projects. And we met one woman who had started with CARE, you know, 20 years prior. She had, she had lived in a, you know, a basic hut. She had to ask her husband for permission to leave the home. Um, she got him to let her go to a care meeting, um, and she started. She's a, a you know a, sustain, a, a subsistence farmer at that point. Um, and through Care's training, um, not only did they improve the yield of their crops, but she also moved into manufacturing of fertilizer, organic fertilizers. 
Um, and fast forward 20 years later, she had run for city, you know, for her village council. She was now running for political office in her state. And when she very proudly says, and guess where my two adult, adult boys go to school? And I said, where do they go to school? You know, I was thinking maybe the capital. She said, University in the United States of America. And I, I, you know, so in one generation, when you invest in the education, empowerment, and enabling of women with real tools to lift not only themselves, but their families and their villages, you could have extraordinary progress. And I can assure you that family and that village's future is forever changed just from, from that consistent work over time. So that's, that's the model. It's yeah. not just one and done. It's really staying with people on a journey over time to build the resilience of whole communities. Yeah. Um, it's a powerful story, Michelle, uh, and really inspiring story. And I remember I had the uh, fortune of going to Ethiopia in 2010 with some dear friends who were involved uh, with efforts to, to bring water uh, wells mm -hmm. and, and other resources, but also to educate girls to to find incentives for families to to send girls to school and keep them in school <clears throat> and i remember visiting some of the villages and <clears throat> consistently there was a water committee mm -hmm. that had been established because mm -hmm. of course these wells need to be sustained yep. they need to be yep. maintained etc rules need to be developed and and in every case the head of the water committee was a woman hmm. uh, very impressive yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but that you talk about the, the need for long-term investment, right? That it's not one and done. Yeah. Um, really important message. And, and it's a similar message to the one you bring to the discussion about diversity, and equity, and inclusion yeah. in our workforce, right? Yeah. In our, and particularly in the national security workforce where you, as I said, have been such a tremendous inspiration and powerful voice in the national security world lending uh, tremendous credibility to the voice of all women in national security as a result of, of your outstanding contributions. Um, and, but I know that you know this is this is a, a, a theme for you in this context as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is when I'm not in government. This is where I, I focus my attention, and I, I get tremendous um, uh, joy out of doing it. But you know. Ensuring that we have women and people of color fully represented in our national security cadre is not just a moral issue. It's not just because it's the right thing to do. You know, if you want a healthy democracy, you want a national security cadre that looks like America. Um, uh, and now there's all this biz business literature that says, you know, the more the diverse, the more diverse a leadership team, the more diverse a, a board of directors the better the performance of the actual company. So we have evidence that more diversity brings better decision making and better organizational performance. And then if you, then the logical, you know, sort of the duh <laughs> factor is, why would you leave half the population out of your talent pool, right? So the challenge is, um, how do you actually do it? Um, and I think that we've had a lot of focus on bringing younger women in um, we have a lot more to work to do in bringing younger people of color in, um, but that's not enough. Um, I was, had the privilege of working on advising a, a study that John Brennan did at the CIA when he was director on diversity because they would you know, recruit a, almost a perfectly representative incoming class every year. But fast forward 15 years and women were only less than a quarter of those who are being considered for promotion to senior intelligence service. And his question is, what is happening? Why are they leaving? What's happening to the women? Is it that they're being, is there bias in the promotion? Is it that they're leaving because the career is not sustainable? Like, what is happening? And, and what he did was a soup to nuts analysis of every step along the way. What are the biases? What are the barriers? Where are we failing to support? And then he went after it with a very comprehensive approach. That's the kind of thing we need to do. It needs to be done at every single level because it takes 30 years to grow a Suzanne Spaulding or a Kathleen Hicks, who's now the you know, CSIS alum and the most senior woman ever in the Department of Defense, or a Christine Warmoth, also a CSIS alum. You know, it just takes time. And it, it's not just hiring them, you know, as a 
intern way back when. It's, it's, it's cultivating at every step and making sure that those barriers and those unfair biases are removed. Yeah, it, it's such an important point because I think we have gotten smarter as a society, as you say, about the value of diversity, of, of a diverse workforce. Going back to the discussion about climate and its disparate impact on women, disparate impact on, on uh, communities of color in, in many countries, um, and bringing those voices to the table uh, helps us to have better insights mm -hmm. uh, into some of those, and uh, both, both the impact and ways to mitigate. Um, <clears throat> but we've, we've gotten smarter uh, more slowly also about <laughs> inclusion, Yeah. right? Yeah. That, that just simply having those good numbers of folks entering into the workforce is not enough. And certainly when I was at DHS uh, leading the wonderful men and women there, professionals in cybersecurity and critical infrastructure security and resilience, cybersecurity particularly was a, was a, is a context yeah. in which, you know, it's not been a comfortable workplace traditionally yeah. for women. It's a leadership and culture issue. And, and I, when I look at the persistence of the problem of sexual assault and harassment in the military, um, it is a leadership and command climate and culture issue. And with that is absolutely something that you, you, have to go, you have to go after aggressively. I mean, I applaud the recent changes in the law because I think that's going to help. But ultimately, it's, in a, it's a leadership accountability uh, question. And it was actually, it was um, when my son graduated from one of the service academies a couple of years ago, and the uh, then Secretary of Defense was coming out to, to speak. And the one line of the entire speech where he had a standing ovation from all the parents in the stadium was when he said, you are the, ne the next leaders going into the fleet, and this is going to stop with you. Hmm. You know, this is your responsibility to create a command climate where this does not happen. This is not tolerated. And the whole, the whole stadium of mostly parents <laughs> stood up and applauded. But I really do think it has to come down to that leader accountability, ultimately, if we're really going to deal with this effectively. Yeah, um, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, but your previous point about your conversation with John Brennan and the work that he did uh, is also important, which yeah. is to gather the, the data to figure mm -hmm. out uh, what are, and it may vary from context to context, what are the key barriers, what yeah. are the key problems here? Yeah. And, I, and I hope that the, the information that, that uh, Brennan and the, and the agency developed in that context is being shared yeah. with others yeah. in government because yeah. um, we all need to, to share those lessons learned and those best practices. Yeah. Um, and then there's, you know, there's uh, the burden ultimately at the end of the day also then falls on the individual. Mm -hmm. right, to figure out how to navigate this and how to rise up and make their voice heard. And, and so, of course, would love to hear what advice you would have for the young women who are contemplating a career in national security, women entering national yeah. security, women in mid-career or, you know, bumping up, yeah. trying to get yeah. to those most senior levels. Yeah. Well, first of all, come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> we need Excellent. you. Great. Um, second is um, choose the boss, not the job. So uh, in my experience, the job description was much less important than finding a boss and a team that valued and really walked the walk of mentorship. You know, a, a, a boss, a team that was going to invest in your professional development, that was going to give you opportunities to take on more and more responsibilities and to really grow as you, you know, are in a particular position. Um, and the other thing I would say um, is, you know, everybody says play to your strengths, and and I I, I agree with that at some level because we tend to enjoy what we're best at the most, but I also think it's worth doing an honest self-assessment periodically to sort of say where where am I struggling, um, and um, to go after those weaknesses if they are likely to become a barrier to your success. So for me, when I was here at CSIS. I was terrified of public speaking. I mean, doing what we're doing now would have given me sweaty palms. It would be the worst thing in the world that I could imagine being forced to do. And I had a mentor here who said, this is a problem. You can't just be a great writer and analyst. You've got to get comfortable communicating. And he kind of developed a little program for me to work up, you know, develop confidence in, 
in speaking and sort of find my comfort zone there. So um, go after your, your weaknesses, not just playing to your strengths. Yeah, great advice. I think that's terrific. <clears throat> um, there it is, and it, is, it falls on those of us that are now, um, you know, as I said the other day, uh, for me anyway, nearing closer to the end of my career than the beginning of, of my career, uh, to make sure that we provide those opportunities mm, uh, for women and, and girls coming up through, particularly speaking opportunities. I have the great privilege of being on the board of Girls Security, which is a okay. wonderful organization. Yeah. I know you're familiar with them. They mm -hmm. go into high schools and talk to high school girls about concepts of national security mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the importance of, they've learned the importance of picking these girls up where they are, mm -hmm. many of whom have never thought about national security, but they have concepts of their own personal security mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and interesting relationships with government oftentimes mm -hmm. where there's a, you know, kind of a mistrust. And so picking them up where they are using a trauma-formed approach to this, mm -hmm. and then bringing them along into a better mm -hmm. understanding sure. of concepts of national security, uh, both to help diversify the pipeline, but also just to ensure that, that women and girls are, are more comfortable being informed and engaged citizens, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. weighing in, mm -hmm. uh, having views mm -hmm. on, on national security issues, which I think is so important. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you do a lot of that kind of work as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do have a few questions from the audience. Okay. Um, uh, one of them, uh, Miriam asked if you could talk about gender inequality in the Middle East um, and whether you have any th thoughts or recommendations on how to uh, alleviate some of those issues. How should we, we proceed? How should they proceed, yeah. et cetera? Well, it is a serious um, problem. It's, uh, you know, you have many, in many cases, traditional cultures that do not see uh, women and men as equal and have not offered them equal opportunity, you know, forever. Um, and so I, I do think you have to make a case for, you know, that the inclusion of women, that the tapping into the talent pool of women is essential to their economic development and their success as societies. And so starting with things like, um, uh, convincing not only the women but the men in the society uh, to avoid child marriage, uh, convincing them to send the, of the value uh, of sending their girls to school and letting them finish school and actually compete for opportunities in higher education, um, convincing them of the value of leveraging women in a, a broader variety of professional fields um, and so forth, and eventually uh, to actually participating in the political process um, as well. I mean, these are, you know, every, every country, every society is in a different place and you have to sort of analyze it individually. But I think the, the pillars are there and where there's plenty of evidence that where those steps are taken, it benefits the whole society in terms of their development and modernization. Great. So a question about going back to the strengths of democracy that we talked about earlier. Um, one of the things that I've been doing here at, with uh, Davey Nair and the team here at CSIS is uh, looking at uh, adversary attacks on our democracy using information operations. Mm -hmm. And you were part of the, the very first meeting that I pulled yeah. together uh, under the, uh, uh, with the support of, of Dr. Hamry. Uh, to look at adversary attacks on our democratic institutions way back in, in 2017. <clears throat> and then we did a deep dive on, on attacks specifically on our trust and confidence in our justice system mm -hmm. uh, as a way to undermine that key pillar of our democracy. And the recommendation that came out of those convenings that you were a part of and our subsequent um, an, a deep dive and analysis um, included all the things that you might anticipate, working with the platforms, trying to deter uh, the bad actors, et cetera, um, from these uh, disinformation campaigns. But ultimately, that the, one of the strongest ways we could counter disinformation and information operations is building public resilience against the content yeah. of that messaging, right? So if the intent, if the content is democracy is broken, it is irrevocably broken, mm -hmm. and the individual is powerless to do anything mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. it, and that there is more that divides you than unites you, right? 
how do we build resilience against that kind of messaging, we've turned to civics education mm -hmm. uh, to a reminder of the, of the uh, importance of democracy, that democracy is under attack, that it is not inevitable or invincible, um, but it is worth defending. Yeah. And it is worth defending not because it's perfect, but because it is capable of change. Right. If we are educated and empowered and, and persistent as agents of change, mm -hmm. do you... Do you uh, I, am, I am all for reinstituting civics education. Um, I can remember my own experience of that, you know. Um, and it's very important that the Americans uh, understand and appreciate the fundamentals of what makes us so remarkable as a, a society and as a, as a country. Um, I do think that in addition to civics, something that in this age I would add is some education about how to tell truth from falsehood on the internet. Um, actually, my, my kids, uh, they're now you know, college age and graduates, but when they were in high school, the high school piloted an effort to try to help them figure out how do I know what's true on the internet? How do I become more of a skeptical consumer of what's coming at me through social media and so forth? And it was really, I thought, very powerful and I, I think that needs to be built on. But I also think we need to create opportunities for people, young people in particular, to experience out, other Americans outside their stovepipe or community. And this is where I think um, expanding opportunities for national service comes in. I don't mean just military service. I mean, you know, it could be Teach for America, AmeriCorps, National Conservation Corps, National Public Health Corps. Um, I don't think we'll ever get politically to the point where we make it mandatory or compulsory, but if we could dramatically expand the opportunities, every year we, we turn away thousands and thousands of young people from these opportunities. And what happens when they, when they go to a city year or they go to one of the Teach for America, they find themselves with people they would never otherwise meet of their same age. You know, a, ki a city kid from, you know, a ghetto area is with a rural kid from a family farm who's with, a, you know, upper middle class kid from Manhattan. And, and they're all thrown together and they start to feel, you know, they start to find more of their commonalities, more what makes, you know, brings them together than what separates them in terms of, and they learn from the, each other's life lived experience. And so I think the more you can create programs like that, that throw young people together for an actual experience, not just an intellectual exercise, but living together, working together, I think that can be very powerful um, to setting us up for a less polarized future. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So the civic virtues, right? Yeah. A sense of civic responsibility. Why should I care about forwarding? Why should I care about whether I forward false information yeah. or not, yeah. right? If we haven't instilled a sense of civic responsibility that you have a responsibility to that wider community, yeah. what you do has an impact beyond yeah. yourself, yeah. then it's hard to to get people to care about searching for the truth, yeah. right? Um, civic engagement as a way of, re, of, of reminding us of what we share. I think <clears throat> it's so important, not only for young people, but for adults. Yeah. So we did a program over the last year and a half, civics as a national security imperative. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if, it, if you agree that it is a national security imperative that we reinstill those democratic values, those civic virtues and yeah. the skills, civic yeah. skills, then you, then you quickly realize that while the long-term investment in K through 12 is good and important, yeah. we need to also work with our adult population yeah. that has been ill-served yeah. uh, by our education system not teaching civics yeah. in yeah. so many places around the country for decades. So another example that I'll mention, another NGO I'm involved with is The Mission Continues, which brings uh, returning 9-11 veterans, people who've left the service, um, and helps them continue that sense of mission through service by uh, pairing them with underserved communities. So you'll have a, you know, a, platoon, a service platoon of veterans, young veterans in LA, and they'll make a multi-year partnership with the city of Watt, the Watts, and they will transform parks, schools, boys and girls clubs, 
over time and in, in providing the core, the nucleus of the effort, they'll also bring in all kinds of members of the community to be part of tr the community transforming itself. And it's a wonderful model to take these people who are just yearning for that continued sense of mission and service and connection when they come home and marrying them up with communities that really are in great need and need that mobilization to address it. That's wonderful. I, I love to hear that. Um, and I do think that you're, <clears throat> you're right in terms of the civic engagement, not just for young people who come together and then find out how much they actually have in common with people they might have thought they had nothing in common with. But I, I, th I think, you know, among adults as well, if you spent the day picking up trash along the side of the highway next yeah. to somebody, <laughs> right? Uh, at the end of the day, you find out they voted for the other person. It's a little harder to totally demonize them. Yeah, exactly. And, and so it wasn't surprising to me to see the Commission on Public Service, National Service, Military Service, um, ultimately include as its first recommendation the reinvigoration of civics education and the teaching of these civic skills yeah. and civic virtues. I yeah. do think it's, it's uh, and, and I am hopeful that a spark has been lit by the reaction to what's happening in Ukraine. That it will serve as a reminder to folks who had become somewhat cynical and despairing of democracies, as we talked about, that there is an important strength mm -hmm. in democracies that we all need to um, come together and support and sustain. Uh, we, do, we have another question from, the, from our audience. Um, that I often get, and I'm sure you do also, <coughs> uh, it is how do you overcome the uh, imposter syndrome, right? <coughs> uh, when you're in these situations, how do you, um, that sense that you really don't, that everyone's gonna find out you don't really belong here. Yeah. Um, and I always, I know for me, I always say, you never entirely overcome right. that. <laughs> uh, the, there's sometimes that voice still rings in your head yeah. and you just, plow through it, but yeah. what is your... I guess I'd say a couple things. First of all, as I've watched different kinds of leaders over the years, I think the best leaders are the people who don't have to be the smartest person in the room, um, but who r recognize that their value is bringing together the best experts, the best people who are smarter than they are in particular disciplines or areas. And, 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 and inspiring and empowering and leading that team to get the most out of the team. Um, and that reduces a lot of the burden then of, you know, I don't have to know the answer. I just have to be the person who's bringing together the right experts to learn from them and listening and learning. And I think the second thing is finding your own authentic style. I mean, I, I remember, you know, when you're, for the first time you're around the Situation Room table, you know, there's this, and there are all, lots of aggressive personalities who want to get the first word in, the, the, the constant word in, the last word in. And one of the things that was really wonderful for me to see is, you know, Bob Gates, who very respected. Um, uh, he was kind of the elder statesman in the room of, oftentimes. He's a very reserved private person. Oftentimes, he would not speak for a lot of the meeting but he would sort of reserve, he would listen, he'd coalesce, he'd synthesize, and he would always look to be the last speaker to say, well, Mr. President, this is what I've heard, this is what I think the options are, this is what I would recommend. And he might have spoken less than anybody else in the meeting, but he, he, when he did speak, it's like that old commercial, when you know, E.F. Hutton speak, this is all before most of your audience's <laughs> memory, but there, you know, everybody this. leans forward and listens. <laughs> you know, it was that kind of reaction. So I would say, you know, be authentic, find your personal style. It may not be the most vocal or the loudest or whatever, but have confidence that when you have something to say, say it, because undoubtedly it'll be a different perspective and it will add value. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful advice, Michelle. Uh, <clears throat> I wish I'd had that advice earlier yeah. in my career as yeah. well. I think that's really terrific. I, I also think it's important for that that women do sort of push themselves a yeah. bit beyond their comfort zone. Absolutely. Um, I have a wonderful sister who is an older sister who has been a great role model for me, and we have helped each other sort of do that yeah. as we've gone along, kind of 
push yourself That's a little good. bit out of your comfort zone. If, if I could just make give one example. In the CIA study, one of the things we found is, you know, if you put out a job description with 10 requirements, and, you know, a guy who had four or five would say, I'm, that's good and I'm gonna apply, I, I, can, I can do this. A woman who had nine typically wouldn't apply. Well, I'm not, I don't have the last requirement, so I really shouldn't apply. So this self-censorship, I have learned over my course of my career, the best moves I've ever made professionally are when I've mustered the courage to take a risk and to lean into something that was slightly terrifying in terms exactly. of the, you know, the Mount Everest of the learning curve. So take that risk. Yeah, if it yeah. doesn't make you a little nervous, you're probably not pushing hard yeah, enough. Yeah, exactly. And I think they found the same with regard to op-eds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember several years ago, there was a, a big examination of why aren't there more women reflected on the opinion pages mm -hmm. of, of major newspapers. And one of the things that those who managed those pages said is that they would call women uh, they would reach out to women and say, could you write an op-ed on, you know, something that's happening in the news? And, and that the women, you know, nine times out of ten would say, oh, you know, I'm not quite the world's greatest expert on that issue, mm -hmm. so maybe you should try someone else. Whereas, you know, a man who knew very little about the subject <laughs> would say yes and do a little reading and write something. So I, I think that's exactly right. And, uh, and, and it does, you know, inevitably lead you to, to be nervous as mm -hmm. you go forward. Mm -hmm. um, but it is the way we advance mm -hmm. and make sure that our voices and our, our uh, insights are contributing to the to the world and to to advancing policies and um, and the position of women and girls around the world and climate change and all mm -hmm. of the things that we care deeply about. That's so right. it's important to engage uh, and be involved. And Michelle, you certainly have done that throughout your whole career with such tremendous competency and compassion. You have have really set a great role model for me and for so many others. And likewise. And I thank you for, for that and for being with us today and sharing your, your, your terrific insights on such a broad range of issues. So great. thank you very much. Thank you. And for your support of Smart Women, Smart Power. Great. Thank you so much.